Anarchism does not have a defining position. At its essence, anarchism is simply the questioning and rejection of authority. Some would take this idea to extreme measures, advocating strong, even violent actions through propaganda of the deed. Others would promote gradual change through the propaganda of the word, while still others would examine their own lives through its context. During the second half of the 19th century, many European immigrants would travel to America, bringing with them their own philosophies, including anarchism through the propaganda of the deed. These radicals, including Emma Goldman and Luigi Galliani, sought to ignite the revolution they believed to be imminent. Incidences such as the Haymarket Affair and the Wall Street bombings were results of these radical philosophies. Soon, anarchism, brought by the European immigrants, began to thrive in the central Vermont town of Barrie. While internationally, anarchism followed propaganda of the deed, causing a violent debate, in Barrie, where the workers received much better wages than in Italy, the movement instead followed propaganda of the word. A tradition of self-expression through carving replaced the violent debate. I was a fair enough carver, so they say, but I was never with the best of them. The best ones came from Italy. No better workman, maybe, but more of the artist in them, more of the inspiration. For generations, Carrara, Italy, was known for its highly desirable marble and the artisans who would carve it. During the 1870s, however, residents struggled against the rising financial burden of the newly formed Italian state. This Italian revolution, as it was known, did not bring equality to the Italian masses. To achieve these ends, socialism and anarchism would thrive in the northern regions of Italy. As they directed their efforts against the state and the monarchists most prevalent in the south, Soon Carrara would become a hotbed of these radical ideologies, particularly anarchism. To many of these skilled artisans, individuality and the freedom of expression came with the trade. Being an artist or uh, being with the arts, you create something. See, that's what anarchism is all about, or socialism. See, we were trying to do something different. But... The idea of putting a piece of oneself into a creation attracted these stone cutters to anarchism's defiance of authority. As conditions worsened in Italy, America beckoned with opportunity and employment in the granite and marble industries. In the 1880s, Italian immigration to America numbered 300,000, in the 1890s 600,000, and in the next decade, more than 2 million. Many of these stonecutters would find themselves in Barrie, Vermont. Known as the granite capital of the world, Barrie experienced a huge influx of foreign workers, beginning with the Scottish in the 1870s. The Italians, more than any other ethnicity, retained strong cultural traditions. Soon the north end of Barrie would become known as the Italian colony. Many of these stonecutters, originating from the Carrara region, brought with them their radical political ideas, namely anarchism and socialism. I always feel that, well, they call themselves anarchists, but you know, I don't think they were, just strong-minded individuals who, I don't think intentionally that they would ever really hurt. Ilia Corti, a self-proclaimed anarchist, is often regarded as one of the best stonecutters Barry has ever seen. His life, however, was cut short, not from the deadly dust that took so many, but from the bullet lodged in his stomach during Barry's most notorious incident involving an anarchist. It was October 4th, 1903, and the noted socialist from New York, Guillaume Sorali, was supposed to speak at Barry's Socialist Labor Hall. A large crowd of both socialists and anarchists had gathered, and grew rowdier and rowdier each minute the speaker was tardy for his appearance. In the midst of the impatience, a tool sharpener, later claiming that he had feared for his life, shot into the crowd, hitting Corti. By midnight, Corti was dead. By the next morning, the incident was dubbed an act of murder. Some believe that a violent debate between the anarchist and socialist brought upon this tragedy. But the violent attitudes of the anarchist incited such actions. The truth will never be known exactly why Alexander Goretto shot and killed Ilya Corti. But the philosophies of Corti did not constitute violence. But see, here there is so many conflicts. There is a different, you know, different faction of it. See. There is the bad and the good and the ugly and everything. See, see nobody is trying to convince, just like I'm not, trying to convince you or him. 
you know, the my anarchism, it would be a lot better. No, because you find other people, they got, you know, they venture the other way and create something. But here they flourish because, see, everybody were individuals. His anarchist traditions of self-expression displayed tolerance for conflicting ideas. Some accounts state that the anarchists were hardly talking, let alone yelling or contributing to the chaos. While the socialists and anarchists differ in ideologies, this shooting was not the result of violent debate, but rather the impatience for a civil debate. During Ilya Korti's funeral, the streets were lined with mourners, anarchists, socialists, and apolitical alike. His memorial would be carved by his brother as a final remembrance to his life. Another example of the Italian community's tolerance of conflicting ideas would be the lectures of Emma Goldman in 1907. Goldman, a Russian propaganda of the deed anarchist, gave several talks in the Barry Opera House, many of which filled the auditorium over full capacity. Will you take that Galliani? He was nothing but a shyster lawyer. To meet him on the street, you'd think he was nothing more than a grease monkey. But he really was a brilliant man. Luigi Galliani was not a stonecutter and was not an artist, yet he became Barry's most well-known anarchist. After being exiled from Italy, Galliani traveled to the United States to spread his belief of revolution and propaganda of the deed. In 1902, Galliani was arrested for inciting a riot in Patterson, New Jersey, but soon fled the country. Due to its close proximity to Canada, the fugitive took refuge in the city of Barry, where he was pleased to find a significant number of self-proclaimed anarchists. Under the name of a local stone-cutting anarchist, Carlo Sabate, Galliani began publishing his newspaper, the Chronica Subversia. This international paper circulated radical ideas throughout the world from his new home of Barry, Vermont. Galliani spread hope for revolution, but did not try to incite it in Barry. The city was more of a refuge for him than a hotbed of extremism. It is difficult to tell the degree of loyalty towards Galliani, but evidence points to the Italian citizens welcoming him while continuing their day-to-day -day lives without thought of rebellion. His newspaper would give Barry an international fame, while seemingly leaving the citizens unchanged in their positions. Though Galliani's ideas may not have been embraced, he was given a deep respect by the entire Italian community. After his location was exposed in a socialist newspaper, local authorities had no choice but to arrest Galliani and extradite him to New Jersey. Nearly 200 people, however, more than the total number of anarchists, gathered at the train station in an attempt to stop his extradition. Nearly that many would sign a petition to the governor of Vermont as well. Nevertheless, after being set free in New Jersey, Galliani returned to Barry to continue his work in relative peace. There ain't any more of that stuff around here that I know of. If it is, they keep it pretty quiet. As Italian traditions would create the anarchist movement in Barry, Vermont, the disappearance of these traditions would bring the movement to an end. The infamous Palmer raids in the 1920s exported foreign radicals, such as Emma Goldman and Luigi Galliani. But in Barry, the individualist anarchist disappeared for another reason. While in Italy, these artisans struggled to make ends meet, but in Barry could make a comfortable $10 a day. Many of these once suppressed artists became shop owners themselves. Even Ilia Corti had partially owned a granite shop before his untimely death. By the 1920s, the anarchist movement in Barry had largely come to an end. A rich laughter rang in the slant of the afternoon sunlight. The laughter of strong men coming from a hard day's work. The laughter of the unconquered and the unconquerable. Today, the anarchist movement in Barry has been largely reduced to two things. The art carved in stone and the stories they tell. To the Italian stonecutter at the heart of the movement, anarchism was only a matter of expression. These immigrants came to the United States politicized from a home fervent in oppression and injustice, carrying with them a drive to create. Radicals like Luigi Galliani never achieved their goal without a rebellion, but the spirit of anarchism inspired these stonecutters to create masterpieces. To them, anarchism was not a revolution. It was a way of thinking. Their artwork is one of the only reminders of the anarchist movement in Barrie, but it is forever carved in stone.